Thank you very much, Nancy. And thanks, thank you very much to the organizers. It's a great honor for me to be here today. And um, thank you, everyone, for coming to listen to what I have to say. OK, so as Nancy said, I would like to talk about um, savings and wealth inequality. And I would like to start from uh, some very important open questions. So first of all, why are some people rich while some others are poor and others are in the middle? What, to what extent can the government affect inequality? And what instruments should they use? So a uh, very important stepping stone to answer these questions and many others is to understand why people save. The goal of this uh, talk is to understand why people save and how this saving behavior leads to wealth inequality. So let me give you a roadmap of this talk. The first thing I would like to do is to provide some basic facts. This is not a seminar about the empirical evidence because I only have about 50 minutes. So I just would like to give some basic facts to get all of us on the same page. Then I would like to talk about the basic Bewley, Haggett, Ayagari, Mororoglu model that I will call Bewley for short from now on, <laughs> which is the building block of many, many models of wealth inequality. And I would like to try to explain what are its main mechanisms and what it can and cannot deliver and why. I, then I would like to talk about richer models that have already been developed and taken to data. I would like to talk about what I think we have learned so far from this uh, body of literature. And then I would like to conclude with what needs to be done and what I think uh, are very important uh, avenues for research, both from the standpoint of topics, but also uh, I will conclude with some methodological thoughts. So let's get started with the basic facts. As I said, this will be a very short review. Um, first of all, I'm sure nobody um, here ignores that uh, wealth and earnings are very unequally distributed with a lot of poor people and a, a very thick tail of uh, richer people, both in earnings and wealth. Um, but wealth is much more concentrated than earnings. So for the talk, I will talk about US data, but these facts hold across many countries. In this table, you see wealth from the 1989 survey of consumer finances data. The reason I take this period, I will talk a little bit about changes over time, but is that many of the models will be calibrated to this period. Um, if you look at the richest 1%, um, about 20, 30% of total net worth is held by the very small group of people. And if you look at the richest 5%, over half of total net worth is held by these people. If you look at earnings, um, here I report the distribution of earnings for working age people. I don't want to include people who are not working. Um, for wealth, it doesn't matter a whole lot because the distribution of wealth is almost the same across the working age and the whole population. So if you look at earnings, um, the richest 1% makes 6%, which is still a concentrated distribution, but much less than the distribution of wealth. So one important question is going to be what kind of saving behavior or forces in the model give rise from the observed concentration of earnings to the one we observe for wealth? Um, an important point that uh, you know, many people have discussed is that if anything, since 1989, things have become more concentrated. And so the puzzle certainly has not gone away. The other important piece of evidence that I would like to mention is that rich people, you know, consistently with these facts, not only have high income and earnings, they also have a high saving rate. Okay? So they save a larger proportion of their flows of earnings, and this happens both before retirement and after retirement. So, um, I just wanted to flash this slide. There are many, this is just a partial list. There are many valuable contributions about the facts, and, uh, but I want to focus on the models today. Okay? So let's talk about the, the building block, the, the Bewley model of wealth inequality. Um, it's uh, characterized by two very important pieces. One is preferences. Here I'm picking the version of a basic Bewley model in the life cycle. But if you want to think about the infinitely lived one, you just have to let t go to infinity. Okay? 
Um, so the person or uh, the household maximizes expected future utility from consumption in all future periods. Um, because I do the life cycle, there is a survival pr uh, probability. Uh, there is a random variable S, which is one if you're alive and zero if you're not alive. And its distribution evolves over age to uh, be consistent with life expectancy. And you derive utility from consumption. The other important piece is the budget constraint. So here, the first uh, important assumption is that there is one asset and it has a risk-free rate of return, R. And um, you consume, these are your accrued uh, assets and uh, returns. And this is where the uncertainty comes from. Okay? So this is your earnings. It's a stochastic process. And um, what people do here, even if they are identical ex ante, ex post, they are hit by earning shocks. They experience different earning histories. And uh, therefore, they are exposed heterogeneous. Okay? So what we typically do is we close the model computing either a steady state in which there is a constant distribution of people over state variables and people's circle through these uh, states. And people typically are impatient because to have a finite support, people are impatient and circle through this distribution of wealth. So what I would like to do is to discuss what kind of saving behavior this kind of models deliver. So here, this is the saving rate by age and wealth for a median earning person. And I'm going to do it by age because I'm using the life cycle version. So here you have current assets. And you can see that the black line is the one for a 25-year-old. If the 25-year-old has little assets, they have positive savings. But for this given earnings level, as assets increase, the saving rate goes to zero and actually becomes negative. Okay? As people age, the retirement saving motive kicks in. So these saving um, rates move to the right, and the crossing point is higher. But the bottom line is that when your health gets to be quite high, your saving rate becomes uh, negative. Okay? So, the precautionary saving behavior in this kind of models is uh, self-insurance against earnings risk, against uh, longevity risk, and then there is savings for retirement. And um, the, the, the important idea is that there is this buffer stock of wealth. Okay? So once you reach this buffer stock of wealth, your savings turn negative and you stop saving. And this is what is really in contrast with the, the empirical evidence uh, especially in the U.S., there is strong empirical evidence that people, when they are very rich, they keep saving at a very high rate. Okay? So this is the intuition why in the Bewley model, and I will show you some tables later, it's hard to get the very rich people because when you re get rich, you stop saving and you don't get truly rich. Okay? So what are the limitations? Well, first of all, uh, the saving behavior is counterfactual compared to the data. And second, these kind of models don't generate very rich people. In addition, I think there is something else. These are very simple models that miss a lot of risks or other elements, uh, other saving motives. And so we might miss or mischaracterize even the savings of people we think we understand. Right? Not only it's clear that we are missing the rich, but it's possible that we think we understand the middle income or the poor while we really don't because we misspecify the environment. And the reasons why people save is very important. So let me give you an example okay, to try to drive this point home that it's not that we don't understand the rich. It's not clear that we understand the saving behavior of other people or at least all of their main saving motives. Suppose, as in reality, uh, that at least in the United States, out-of-pocket uh, medical costs and long-term care costs are a significant people, uh, risk that people face, especially during retirement. So what is going to happen is that the people who have low lifetimes are insured by the government through mean tested programs, but upper and middle income people will really face a lot of medical expense and long-term care risk. So if you abstract from this risk in the model, typically what we do, we try to match average or total or some measure of assets because we want to match the resources and the economy, so we are going, typically going to assume these people are very patient. But then, you, when you evaluate government insurance, what you're going to have, you evaluate government insurance on people who are very patient as opposed to people who save a lot because they face a lot of risk. So you are going to get uh, 
evaluations about these government programs that are very misguided because you are misunderstanding the savings of a lot of people. Okay? So going from the standard Bewley model, I would like to talk about six important ingredients. There will be others, but I need to make some choices, and I will try to be clear about why I think that these six ingredients are important. So I would like to do, you have seen these equations before, and I would like to show you what are the new pieces. Okay? So the first one is when we introduce bequest motives and the transmission of human capital across generations. Well, when you introduce bequest motives, you add uh, to the utility function some value from the assets that you leave to future generations. Okay? So you are changing preferences. The other thing that you do is at some point people receive this bequest when their parent dies, and um, if you allow for transmission of human capital, one very easy reduced form way to do it is to link the earnings of parents and children. Okay? So the second um, kind of story that I would like to discuss is heterogeneous preferences. Okay? In this kind of story, you also modify preferences, but you just assume that people have different discount factors and risk aversion. Okay? The third story is going to be that it's not really preferences that uh, are uh, uh, what we work on, but they are rate of returns. Instead of everyone facing the same rate of return, we have a rate of return that is idiosyncratic to the person and is stochastic. The fourth story is entrepreneurship. And here, what we do is people can choose to run a business, in which case they have a production function in which they invest some capital to run the business. Okay? Or if they don't run the business, they get the same earnings fluctuations they get in the basic Bewley model. So this is also essentially about how you model resources here. Um, the fifth story is that maybe we are not getting the earnings risk right. Okay? And they, so it's also um, in the budget constraint. And the sixth story is that, well, maybe we are getting this risk right, but there are other risks, for instance, coming from medical expenditures and long-term care that we don't allow for in the budget constraint, but they are important for a large fraction of people. So let me go to the first story. Um, why did I pick these six um, stories, besides the fact that I wrote four of those stories I wrote on? <laughs> Um, I think a model is always a very simplified version of reality, and uh, how you decide how you should make your model complex should be grounded in empirical evidence. Okay? So for each of these stories, I will first, you see these little dots here? So this is the empirical evidence that underpins that story, and that makes you think, yes, this is something important that I should actually introduce in a model. So for each story, I will have the empirical evidence, then the model, and the results. So, bequests and human capital. So, there, is a lot, uh, there was a lot of debate between Koplikov and Summers and Modigliani that was later settled, in my opinion. The idea is that when you look at capital today, you can distinguish the one that has been saved by people who are alive today and the one that has been inherited by people who are already dead. And in the aggregate, notice it doesn't tell us anything about distributions in the aggregate, the amount of capital that is transferred across generations, we can debate if it's 50 percent or 60 or 70, but it's large. Okay? So there is a lot of capital that is earned by our parents and transferred to us. The second one is more um, at the individual level. There is a lot of empirical evidence that earnings, education, socioeconomic status of parents and children are linked. Right? So this is a, a evidence about the human capital part, while this is about physical, cap, uh, physical capital. And while this is aggregate, this is at the individual level. Okay? So that's why I think it was worth exploring this story. There is a lot of evidence that this can be important in understanding wealth and savings. So let me tell you what I did in this paper. Um, what the first part that you have seen the OLG with the retirement period and earnings and lifetime uncertainty is the basic model I have shown you so far. What I would like to point out is that typically you have earnings risk and you have mortality risk. So people save in these risk-free assets. There are no annuity markets, as people don't typically buy them in the data in many uh, countries. 
So people uh, happens, some people live, uh, die early, and they leave accidental bequests. Right, accidental in the sense that they would like to consume them, but they die early on, and so they leave bequests. So when you introduce a bequest motive, and I will be much more explicit about what this means, you not only have accidental bequests, those don't go away, they are still there, but you also have voluntary bequests because you derive utility from transferring some resources to your children. Okay? So you will have two types of bequests in this environment. So I would like to, to remind you what the problem is. You have this additional term in the utility function, the intergenerational correlation of earnings and the received bequests, and I would like to tell you more about what I did for the bequest motive. So I picked um, a warm glow altruism in which you derive utility from living assets. And there are two important things to say. Um, while this is a typical CRRA function, this parameter, it's very important. If this parameter is zero, the marginal utility of even a, of a small bequest is very large. So even poor people would try really hard to leave something to their descendants. But this is a very, uh, has very counter factual implications because many, a large fraction of people in the US, if you look at people without a surviving spouse, which would be the counterpart in the model, 30% have little to no value. Okay? So you need to make sure that the distribution of bequests in your model looks like something in the data. The other thing we could have thought about is to have a more altruistic model. You know, the problem is that the altruistic model also has very strong uh, implications about intergenerational risk sharing. So while I think the, op the question of how we should model bequest is important and still open, I think this is a very good uh, starting point and it matches the observed distribution of bequests. So importantly, I do not pick model parameters to match wealth inequality. Uh, for instance, I pick parameters of the bequest distribution to match uh, moments of the bequest distribution. So what you get for wealth is sort of an identifying restriction. It's not something that you try to match by construction. Okay? So let me show you uh, the results from this model. So the first line you have already seen, except that I'm adding the wealth Gini concentration. So here you have the data from the 1989 SCF, and you have the how much wealth has the richest 1%. In this line, what you have is, um, I actually want to say something. So this line, it's actually two different models that have the exact same implication. This is the model you have seen with no bequest motive. Whether you give the bequest to everyone alive, the accidental bequest, like we usually do in many models, or you give them to the children, you still get these exact numbers. Okay? So what is going on is that some people get a large bequest, some people get a small bequest, it's like winning the lottery, their saving behavior doesn't change, nothing changes for wealth inequality. Okay? Here, with the blue, you see when we start adding, I, here I want to add this warm glow bequest that is a luxury good, and you can see that the concentration of wealth in the richest 1% doubles. What is going on here is that this nonomotheticity in the bequest motive implies that when you have either high earnings histories or you get a large bequest, that's when you want to leave a bequest. So some of the wealth gets concentrated because it's passed on across generations and that's how some rich families arise. The other thing I want to point out is that this model does a really poor job of matching the poor people, right? In the data, uh, about 6% has zero or negative wealth. And in a life cycle model in which people start with little to no assets, like in the real world, these models over predict the, fra and, you know, the adding bequests that nothing good on this side of the distribution. Um, you over predict the number of poor people, okay? So when you add human capital inheritance, you have that not only some families leave more assets to their children and this propagates, but their human capital, their earnings are correlated, so there is a little more concentration. Okay? So let's summarize the findings from this first uh, story, accidental bequests and uh, voluntary bequests and human capital. So first of all, you know, sometimes you read, oh, um, bequests are actually uh, um, equalizing and so on and so on, so forth. What this paper tells you is that 
it's not as much the receipt of the bequest that matters, is whether you have a saving rate that is increasing in wealth. Okay? So it's really the bequest motive rather than the passive receipt of an inheritance that changes wealth concentration because it changes saving behavior. You have also seen that adding ability, uh, correlation of ability across generations help generate uh, richer families over time. Um, but the big thing is that even with bequests and intergenerational links, the wealthy are not wealthy enough and the poor are too poor. Okay? So this is making progress, but it's not all of the story. And, you know, I think when you try to calibrate these parameters to other moments, you can get a better idea why, to how much this can explain. Okay? So let me go to heterogeneous preferences. So, again, facts. Why should we even think about heterogeneous preferences? Well, I think there is a, a very large body of evidence from the applied uh, microliterature, the preferences are heterogeneous. You can look at different methods, Euler equation versus life cycle, method of simulated moments, maximum likelihood. You can look at uh, US data and the PSID. We have Danish registry data. There is a lot of evidence that people are heterogeneous in their patients and their risk aversion. So what do we have in terms of models? People have studied heterogeneous preferences, I'm sure, the paper 99% of the people in this room know is Cruzel and Smith. So what Cruzel and Smith did, they took an infinite leaf agent model and they found that a little bit of heterogeneity in beta goes a long way. You know, in the macro tradition, you try to say it's, uh, you only need a little because we are very skeptical of heterogeneous preferences. Um, but it still, you know, it makes sense, but the rich, you cannot match the upper tail. It's not like, uh, you know, Bill Gates is twice as patient as everyone else, right? Um, so it's there, but it's probably not the reason why the rich are so rich. Even more interesting, I think, as I will argue later, I think uh, using a life cycle model introduces much more discipline in what you're doing. Uh, and papers by Hendricks and Gonzalo Paz Pardo used uh, life cycle models and found that, first of all, in life cycle model, you need much more preference heterogeneity. And what happens is that, yes, you can increase the rich, that can be a little richer, but then the poor will be poorer, right? Because you have this gap in, in preferences. And they also looked at both beta and sigma, uh, at least Gonzalo did, as opposed to Cruzella Smith that bo uh, mostly played with beta, okay? So what do we have on this story? So, you know, on the one hand, I think the evidence from the applied literature is fairly substantive that there are these differences, so I don't think we should completely discount this explanation. But I don't think that this is the reason why the rich, the super rich are very rich. So I think this is an important mechanism that we can use in conjunction with others, uh, but not the whole story. So my third um, story is about heterogeneous returns. So this is a new paper uh, that came after the models that I will tell you about. Um, and it uh, has a exceptional Norwegian data um, so that you can use these uh, very rich data to compute returns from stocks, from bonds, from private equity. Um, and uh, these authors found, find that returns are very heterogeneous. For instance, 200 basis points across the 10th and the 90th percentile of the distribution. They are also heterogeneous within asset classes, so whether they are uh, bonds or risky assets. And uh, interestingly, they are correlated. People with higher wealth tend to have higher returns, and people with uh, private equity entrepreneurs also tend to have higher returns. Okay? So um, these papers came before the evidence, so they were ahead of their time. Um, so uh, what... The, well, yeah, it's, even if it's 2015, I think it, it was in the works well before we heard about the Norwegian data. Um, so this paper, what it does essentially is to choose the, um, the, the, this um, process for the rate of return at the individual level to match wealth inequality. And the conclusion is that, first of all, the rate of returns alone cannot match the distribution of wealth. You also need bequest motives. And... Um, 
In my opinion, this is a very interesting explanation, but we need to move forward, okay? So this is sort of a, perhaps an interesting mechanism that works, but it's a bit of a black box. First of all, I think it's very important to be more serious about matching these uh, implied uh, returns to data. But more importantly, these rate of returns are endogenous. They are endogenous to your portfolio choice, they are endogenous to entrepreneurial choice, they are endogenous to a variety of behaviors, and you cannot just assume that they fall from the sky, especially if you want to evaluate taxation. So, papers that have an endogenized to some extent, and you know, they did it, they didn't mean to do it, because we weren't thinking about <laughs> these particular problems, were papers uh, on entrepreneurial choices, starting with Vincenzo Quadrini, um, there is a recent paper by Khan and Kim that thinks about this, an optimal stock and bonds portfolio with the participation cost, so you get an endogenous rate of return, depending on if you're rich enough, you get more stocks, you get stocks. Uh, and also, you might think that perhaps there is a story about uh, investor uh, sophistication and that rates of return might be related to different knowledge about different assets. But the point I want to make is that I think it's important to go beyond this idea that rates of return are heterogeneous and try to think where do they come from. So that's why uh, I, would like to, I would like to talk about this story because I think it not only endogenizes rate of return, but there is also a lot of other empirical evidence that entrepreneurship is strongly related to wealth. Okay? So besides the fact that the paper is mine, of course. <laughs> So, um, let me start with the facts again, okay? Regarding entrepreneurs, many entrepreneurs are wealthy, and many wealthy people are entrepreneurs. So far, this is a correlation. So, this is my uh, paper with Marco Caggetti. As usual, um, you know, entrepreneurship is like pornography. Um, so, what we try to do is we have a specific notion of what an entrepreneur is in the model, and what we do is we try to go to the data and be as close as possible to that notion. Okay? So when you, in the survey of consumer finances, when you consider an entrepreneur someone that not only is self-employed, but owns a business and actively manages it, what you find is that in the richest 1% of people, over half are entrepreneurs according to this very restrictive criterion. If you are more generous, that's 80%. Okay? So you can see at least that many rich people are entrepreneurs according to this definition. There are other, I think, important facts about entrepreneurs. The first one is that exactly like the rich people, they have high saving rates, and specifically to entrepreneurship, they have a high saving rate before they enter entrepreneurship. Maybe they are trying to save to get their business started and after to develop their business. There is also a lot of evidence that at least part of the entrepreneurs face borrowing constraints, so they need some skin in the game to be able to enter and to expand their firm. And uh, in addition, they hold very undiversified portfolios. Okay? So these are all facts that the model I will show you will reconcile very nicely, even though it's a very simple model. So as I mentioned briefly before, at every period, people decide whether to be a worker or an entrepreneur, so there is an occupational choice. If they are an entrepreneur, they are endowed with some ability, zeta, that is persistent over time, but it's stochastic. And they run the production function, where you can add hiring workers, nothing really changes. What is important is that if you invest capital K, there is a decreasing return. And then you get back undepreciated capital. Then, the other part that is very important is that there is a collateral constraint. So, A are your assets, and K your, is your working capital in the firm. This simple equation is simply meant to say, if you have more assets, so you save more, you can expand your business more. Okay? Why are rates of return endogenous in this framework? Well, first of all, rate of returns are the marginal product of capital for the firm, so there are decreasing rates of return, so they depend on firm size. And second, uh, until entrepreneurs are constrained, they will invest everything in the firm, but after, they will split their assets between the risk-free and the firm, and so there will be that part too. So this model, which I also didn't calibrate to match the wealth inequality, but to match other important facts of entrepreneurs, also matches wealth inequality very well. Okay? And notice that the fraction of entrepreneurs 
that in the SCS that satisfies our definition is 7.5%. So it's an overall small fraction of the population. And, you know, I don't have the time to show you everything, but it matches a lot of other facts that you observe in the data. So let me summarize what we learned from this entrepreneurship story. First of all, they, it can generate a lot of rich people. And the key mechanism is that if being able to invest in your firm is potentially very profitable. So you need to save to, in, to get this high rate of return. If your firm size for at least some entrepreneurs is high, the large optimal firm size, then you will keep saving even when you're rich. Right? So this is the mechanism that drives a high saving rate even for richer people. Um, and the model, I think, rationalizes in a very nice way all of the facts I showed you about entrepreneurs. Uh, it, it rationalizes a very undiversified portfolio because initially you're constrained and your return is very high. Uh, the high saving rates you want to enter and expand your business and the high wealth. Okay. So let's talk about the fifth story. It's about do we really understand earnings dynamics or are we really with our little AR1 process or something like that really rep representing well the risks that people face. Okay. So again, I want to start from the facts. Okay. There is a lot of applied micro papers that have, you know, I, I cite uh, a few that are recent and particularly suited to make this point. But there are hundreds of papers trying to understand how earnings dynamics evolve. And basically, one very important feature is that they are very rich, much richer than when we have a symmetric AR1 or even a transitory and permanent component. And importantly, high earners face a lot of risk, right? You can see that if I'm a high earner and I face a lot of risk, so my risk depends on my earnings level, I might save a lot. Okay? So there is an open question as to whether this is a realistic method, um, really driving savings to a large extent or not. So let's talk about models. So um, back in 2003, uh, Castaneda, Diaz, Jimenez, and uh, Victor Yosrul uh, used exactly this method. And the goal of their game was, I want to pick Y and its stochastic properties to match cross-sectional moments of earnings and wealth. So very clear exercise. Can we do it? Okay. The answer is yes. We can match wealth concentration perfectly as long as you choose the appropriate uh, earnings process. However, this is what you get. Right? This is what you need to do that. Your earnings level are normalized to 1 at the lowest level, 3, 10, or 1,060. Okay? So if you are 1,060, like the awesome state or Tiger Woods, um, you have a 20% probability of dropping, of having a 99% or 99.9% .9 depending on which of the other states you fall to. And you can see here, if you are super rich, the only week you can move your marginal utility or consumption to save at home because tomorrow exogenously you lose it and it's gone. Okay? So I think, you know, they said, well, it's really hard whether this is consistent with the data or not because survey data at the household levels typically have a bunch of problems that we don't have the time to summarize, so they don't have the high earners. If they are a small fraction and you miss them, you know, tough luck. Okay, so um, this is what we are doing with the, uh, Giulio Fella and Gonzalo Pazpardo. What we do is we go to data, okay? And we use a non-parametric earnings process that has dynamics over the life cycle, persistent, the, the, the persistence changes over the life cycle, and it's very flexible in terms of your earnings level, can have very different risks, skewness, and kurtosis. And we use this process to match moments from tax data. Okay? So what we find is that you know, we think that this goes a long way to solving this criticism that you don't really have the high earners in the survey data. So what we find is that one victory, okay? So remember how the poor people are too poor in this life cycle, Bewley models, right? So here, with this kind of risk, you have that the poorest 60% of people actually start looking like in the data, okay? So there is something about understanding these earnings dynamics. However, we don't find those kind of extreme drops 
And for the high earners, yes, they had more variance, yes, they had more skewness, but it's not enough to really generate Bill Gates uh, or even the 1% without talking about the super rich. Okay? So at least the poor people are realistically poor. And when you think of another measure of how people can self-insure, you can look at the variance of the consumption as people age. Right? If the variance of consumption as people age spreads out a lot, there is some less capacity of self-insurance. And this earnings process can match it while the previous AR1 has a very large increase in inequality over the life cycle, very counterfactual. So my view from the earnings risk is that it is important to better think how we move away from this AR1 methodology, especially, we, you know, we propose a very simple way to do it. Uh, but this is not really why rich people save. And, you know, this data set doesn't have the entrepreneurs. This is earnings data. But if you really think it's entrepreneurship, I think an entrepreneur is not a wage shock. I think you should go beyond that and you should model it explicitly. Okay? So the last, the last of the six stories I would like to tell you about, it's a bit different. It doesn't come from a standard model in which we are trying to match wealth inequality, but I think it has a lot of convincing ideas that this is important. Okay? Fact one. These are our young chicks, 74-year-olds. Uh, okay? We are looking at people who are retired. They age. We observe them uh, until very advanced ages. We have a lot of them. And here we are plotting their out-of-pocket, so what they spend after government insurance and private insurance pays, and, uh, by age. And we do that by permanent income. Okay? You can think by education. That would look very similar. What is going on is that medical expenditure after age 90 really start to rise, but especially so for people with high permanent income. Notice that these are also the people who live longer, right? So they can be hit by the double whammy of living a long time and being stuck in a nursing home for a number of years, so they face a lot of risk, okay? The other piece of evidence I would like to bring to the table to convince you that this is something important is we also have uh, the same Chicks here, 74-year-olds, I'm showing you two courts. Some start at 74, some start at 83. These are their savings by permanent income. So what you see is that the high permanent income people start out retirement. Well, I mean, they have been retired a while. Okay, start out <laughs> in our sample with high um, assets, and they really hold on to them. It's not like they start accumulating until they are very old. The poor people, they never save because they rely on government programs like uh, Medicaid and Social Security. Oops. Uh, while the middle income people are the ones that show most this saving. Okay. So what did we do with Eric and John? Well, what we did, we estimated the structural model of retirement and we took the medical expenditure from data and we took them as a shock, as other people had done before, to the, your resources. We also allowed for a consumption floor because there are government programs that do provide one. So let me tell you what are the key findings from this model. So we have our 74-year-old chicks. Okay? Um, this is one court. The dashed line is our baseline model. So if you take the 74-year-olds, that's how our model would predict they dissave during retirement with medical expenditure and long-term care risk. Okay? So what you see is that you, know, uh, you have this line for each permanent income level. The solid line is what happens if we remove, uh, if we remove medical expenditures completely. Okay? So what is this graph showing you? This graph is showing you that once you estimate the model like this, medical expenditure exp ex explain a large portion of savings in retirement. So there is, the question is, you know, we are trying to think, are we talking about 1%, are we talking about the 5%, are we talking about the middle income? So there is a very interesting paper by these authors that uses a data set that actually looks at upper to middle income people, right? You might think, well, how far up does this uh, saving motive spread? And um, they find that... Um, first of all, they find that the same interesting dichotomy that we do. Say, pick a, a 55-year-old, so someone very young for us. Um, if they have below $100,000, what is going to happen with long-term care risk 
is that they know they are likely to get against the government insurance, which is tested, so they actually start this saving faster. Okay? On the other hand, if you have 100,000 or more, this long-term care risk makes you save more because you're very unlikely to rely on the government consumption floor. So this is, uh, introduces a very interesting inequality in savings in old age, the combination of long-term care and this kind of government insurance. Okay? Uh, interestingly, in terms of, of what I was discussing of how rich are these people really for which this matters, well, I, my answer is fairly rich. So what they find in their data set, again, very representative of upper to fairly rich people, is that the effect in percentage terms is strongest for those at the top 20th percentile of financial wealth, which is much more concentrated than total wealth. Okay? So it spreads fairly high up in the income and wealth distribution. So my conclusion from this is that we don't have yet a model of wealth inequality that allows for this medical expenditure, but they are clearly important, they are large, and they really affect the savings behavior in retirement and supposedly before. Um, and I think they, it's very important to understand savings. So let me go to the conclusions and directions for future research part. I first would like to say what I summarize, what I think we have learned from these six stories. The first thing is, well, um, you know, I will surprise you, now, no, not everyone is middle-aged, okay? So, you know, in the infinite lived model, everyone is middle-aged, everyone has some assets and is facing this earnings risk, but that's a really big uh, abstraction if you want to think about these issues. In addition, you know, precautionary savings is not the only reason why people save, and again, that is the lion's share of uh, savings in the infinitely lived agent model. So I think it's really important to model the life cycle, and it's really important because we also need to do a better job of modeling retirement. So the way my friend uh, Cristonetti puts it, it's not a happy period in which you eat cake and wait to die, it's a period of really high risk, okay? And I, I think, especially with increasing medical expenditures and aging, we really need to worry about this, even if you want to think about inequality. Intergenerational links, we have seen, are important, bequests and human capital. I think um, we have seen that entrepreneurship has the potential of explaining a lot of wealth inequality, and that household earnings dynamics matter. So let me go to the part where I pontificate. <laughs> on the beautiful papers that we should all uh, write. Uh, and Victor Rios Rule told me I should be very inspirational, so hopefully, you know. Um, so I would like to talk about the contents, and then I would like to talk a little bit about the methods. As Nancy said, I really think that a lot of value comes from, you know, the contents and being, being really serious about how you go in, in about these models. So first I would like to talk about human capital. Health, the family, rates of returns on wealth, and changes in inequality over time. So human capital, well, we assume earnings are exogenous. Maybe some papers have a little bit of labor supply, but wages are still exogenous. If you're writing a theory on how inequality in wealth comes up, I think it's fairly important that we start thinking how inequality in wages translates into inequality in wealth and how these two forms of inequality come up. Clearly, if we think about policy, the two are going to be very interrelated. They are not going to just affect one. Okay? So I think this is very important. Two, health. Uh, well, Gary Becker told us it is a very par important part of human capital. When you're young, health affects both your capacity to work and you know, your savings through medical expenditures and the capacity to earn. And when you're old, well, we, I have already told, shown you what happens after age 74. Um, so I think, you know, first of all, thinking about the whole life cycle and thinking how health evolves and how that affects labor supply and inequality in wealth and earnings is very important. Going beyond that, I think we need to be more ambitious and think about what determines health and how the determination of health interacts with wealth and inequality. It's difficult, but you know, we are getting better at understanding things, and we should really try to think about this. I've shown you how bequests and human capital really are important. Okay? So, well, the family is much more than bequests and human capital. Um, 
I really think we need to think harder about what the family does, at least model some important aspects of the family. For instance, um, the family has the labor supply of both partners with young and the wages of both partners with young and the medical expenditure of both partners when old. And there is the labor supply that you can use to some extent to self-insure and there are marriage and divorce risks. So I think it's very important to better understand how an inequality is affected by the family. Okay? Rates of returns on wealth, I think it's very important that we better understand how they are determined. Is entrepreneurship a big one? I think so, but you know, it's always good to show that your beliefs hold, have some empirical counterpart. And what are the other important determinants? Uh, in the paper that I mentioned about uh, Guizzo, Pistaferri, and co-authors, about 25% of returns, it's either a fixed effect of the person or observables. Okay? So there is a significant amount of this variation we can uh, try to explain. Dynamics of the time, super important. Um, we have some excellent papers, but there are just two or three. Um, so, you know, understanding why richer people are getting richer, and maybe the middle class is getting squeezed. I think it's very important. I have talked only about the static picture, but I think it's really important to think also about the dynamics. Um, I would like to conclude with methods. We have seen one or two stories at the time. I think it's about time that we try to have richer models. In we, you know, if you only have one story at a time, it's first of all, on the one hand, you might be overestimating because you think it's all entrepreneurship. But on the other hand, there might be some interesting synergies if you have more than one in which two explanations have some kind of multiplier effect. So I really think it's important to have a much richer model of saving behaviors. Um, you know, this brings the question of how are we going to identify these different saving models. I think it's really important to be serious about what drives your model and what aspects of the data identify your model. So this is where I think that really digging into a household level data set is going to really help. Um, first of all, you can try to establish new facts at the individual or the group level that the model has to match. And second, I think it's, you know, as we have seen in the superstar or the Tiger Woods shock, you match cross-sectional facts, you get really counterfactual risk from the standpoint of the individual over the life cycle. Right? So these uh, micro-level data sets are incredibly important to co give you a sensible representation of the risk that people face, which after all is one of the key reasons why they save. 